Welcome everyone, my name is Chris Batchelor, and I'm with National Parents Organization and we are here tonight for the 19th Suffolk District uh, candidate panel and we are here to talk uh, primarily about shared parenting and parental alienation and topics surrounding uh, the family. So I'm going to introduce my panelists here and welcome gentlemen. Uh, we have uh, Richard and Paul and uh, both are running for seats again in the 19th District. So uh, Richard, you're at the top. Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, tell us what you're running for, uh, and in two minutes or less, tell us why you're running for a seat in the district. Right. So I'm running as uh, running for state representative in the 19th Suffolk County. That represents uh, Winthrop and a portion of Revere. Uh, um, so I'm running as an independent candidate. In full disclosure, uh, my father actually uh, still is a current active member of the National Parents Organization and also served as a citizen's rep for Governor Patrick uh, on the um, on the uh, working group for child uh, child center family reform. Uh, so I'm 21 years old. I'm a senior at Emerson College and I, I'm running as an independent because, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of of partisan politics in our country. And I think that we need to move past partisan politics and move forward into making decisions and making policy that are going to better the people of our community and of our great state of Massachusetts. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, Paul, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, and I'm Paul Caruccio. And um, I thank you for tuning in this evening. I um, am happy to have this forum to discuss. I'm happy the three of us here uh, are going to uh, lend some exposure to the uh, plight of um, families and children. So uh, I am Paul Caruccio and I spent my career as a small business owner. And for 34 years, I was the owner and operator of Michael's Hallmark in Michael's Mall in Winthrop. I also had a second location outside of the area in a um, city called Medford. I'm a competitive runner and I'm a swimmer. I'm a conservative candidate, the state representative of Rivera and Winthrop, and I'm Republican. And some of the goals in my campaign is restore balance to Beacon Hill and help to achieve a true two-party system in Massachusetts. I wanna return transparency, trust, and civility to politics. I wanna strengthen our community. Tonight, I hope we get a foothold in strengthening our families and children in community. I want to listen to all of the issues and concerns of the constituents in Revere in Winthrop. And tonight we're discussing a very important topic, families and parenting. So there's many goals in my campaign, such as addressing the plight of our businesses and how our residents are suffering from the COVID shutdown and that we need to restate, restart our state and our community. And it's imperative that we have a candidate who's going to grow jobs and revitalize our business base, get the economy moving at full strength, provide safety and security to our communities, and protect hardworking, vital middle-class citizens, and naturally our families. Well, the main reason I'm here tonight is because I understand your plight and what brings you here. But first, you should know that I have lived your experiences. I fought your fight, and I understand the importance of this mission. Tonight, I hope to learn more. I hope to learn from your eyes what's important in the current state of family and parenting in Massachusetts. I want to learn what can be accomplished to improve our laws. So let's get going and work together. Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you for that. Uh, Paul, thank you for that introduction. And the first question is, uh, the divorce courts uh, are often designed to cause parents to fight with each other in a winner takes all attitude. Uh, what would you do if elected to ensure that citizens are treated fairly in the family law system? Uh, Richard, we'll go uh, with you first. Absolutely. One of the biggest things that uh, is a big key term here is money, 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 money. Uh, one thing that I will push for as representative is the presumption of shared parental responsibility. Too many times in our system, they award uh, full custody to one parent. And, and we know, we know, we know, we know for a fact that it is in the best interest of the child to see both parents as much as possible um, and per, uh, in a best case scenario, equal time. So one of the things I'll push for, like I said, 
is the presumption, the legal presumption of shared parental responsibility. So both parents have the ability to see their kids. There's not a fight for who gets to see the most kids. There's not a waste of financial resources in placing a stressful burden on families by, by making, the children, making the child have to choose a parent or you know, an alienation of one parent. Thank you for that, Richard. And, uh, and Paul, the same question for you. Uh, tell us about what you would do to ensure that uh, families are treated fairly in the court. Well, first of all, I have to agree with um, Richard entirely. I, I agree with everything that he stated. Another thing that I found in the uh, judicial system when it comes to family and parenting in divorces is that the system is slow and cumbersome and they need to speed up the process. So that process needs to go at a much faster pace. And I know that the judicial system doesn't work so quickly, but then again, um, in the divorce um, judicial setting in Massachusetts, they're not overburdened either. So I think there should be a time um, limit on how long it takes them to hear cases and how long it takes them to render decisions. Another problem in Massachusetts that I have found from my personal experience and sometimes you get a judge, and once you get a judge, you can't change that judge. And the judge sometimes comes with um, prejudicial um, misconceptions about the participants. And once you're locked into a judge that's closed-minded, there's no escape from that. So I think we ought to look at the possibility of um, participants having an avenue to potentially request a change of venue or judge. The other thing wouldn't be bad to have an independent board to review some of the decisions and how it relates to um, bias or, or bad decisions to give um, judges maybe an outline to compare their, the decision that they render versus an outline of uh, a fair and nonpartisan um, ruling. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, it certainly seems there is a uh, consensus across the board that the uh, court systems and need some uh, help with legal changes. Uh, any comments uh, from either of you after hearing both responses? I mean, I, I can give a little bit of a, a short anecdote. You know, my parents went through uh, went through family court for seven years um, before my parents decided to scrap the lawyers and sit down and talk. And you know, shortly after, you know, we had, there was an agreement. Um, so. That was only after seven years and hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, attorney fees and court fees and all that kind of stuff, uh, which basically stalled out and solved nothing. So when my parents sat down and solved it themselves, it was solved pretty quick. And now we have the agreement that, that uh, is in place uh, at, the, at this moment in time. So when it comes down to it, there needs to be there needs to be a way that we can uh, get rid of that long, long time frame, as, as Mr. Crujo was talking about. And I, I have to say, if I can uh, chime in, um, to start with the focus that there needs to be equal time so that that as a starting point, I think is a huge advantage. I think that that has changed a little bit um, in Massachusetts. It's improved a little bit over the years. Um, I went through this process over the last um, 10 to 20 years. And I believe there's been some improvement as I noticed that Massachusetts is rated as a C um, as far as responsiveness in this issue where I think 20 years ago, they probably would have been a D or an F. Um, but I think the starting point that Richard suggests is absolutely right. And I, um, I appreciate the fact that he made that. Well, that rolls right into our next question here, which is uh, we know from surveys in several states uh, that many courts are not seen as fair to both parents. Some courts are gender biased, while others are biased towards the person who filed for divorce. Uh, what are your thoughts on the court bias and what you would do if elected to reduce or eliminate that bias? Uh, we'll start again with you, Richard. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So like I talked about in the last one, uh, legal presumption of uh, shared parental responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with the work that National Parents Organization has done. Uh, you know, they've pushed for it. The big pushback that they get is from the attorneys. It's from the people who make all their money from, from the fighting in court. So when it comes down to it, we need to make sure that families are being protected. No more can we, can we fall into the, to the sort of the trap of, of money and, and all that kind of stuff. We need to make sure that, um, that we make, that we 
we don't negotiate. There needs to be, there has to be a shared um, shared parental responsibility, presumption, legal presumption of shared parental responsibility so that when, when you go into court, there is, no, there is no bias, there is nothing. There is a legal presumption that unless there is a severe problem in the case, then it should, that both parents should get equal, uh, equal um, custody of the child. Thank you for that. And uh, Paul, your thoughts? Well, I want to go back to um, uh, judicial um, commission um, to look at the decisions um, that come out of the courts and how they relate to gender. And I think a commission of the judges themselves um, looking at the rulings and trying to decide whether or not, in fact, there is gender bias um, in their decisions. Now, my personal experience is that Hell yeah, there's a lot of gender bias, but I actually reviewed some of the NPO videos and I, um, I noticed that throughout the country that it actually goes both ways. Well, if it's unfair to um, come out in a biased manner against the male, then it is equally unfair against the female. Um, so I would um, encourage the judges to um, assemble a committee to come up and review decisions and come up again with a checklist that they can use when they do render decisions. The other thing, um, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. And I know judges get extensive training, but um, if they would make sure that this type of training is incorporated into their normal um, training schedule regiments. Um, the other thing I think is when you have problems with the judicial system, normally it's enforced or the first responder is like a police department. And police, I'm all for police departments. I support them. I think they do a great job. I think that's where we can concern with safety of everybody, including safety of themselves. But I think the first um, impulse is to think that if it's a male, that that individual is... Um, immediately a threat when that's not the case. And I know I have seen myself um, issues in which I was just going to visitation, the police end up in the process uh, in, you know, unnecessarily. And the first thing that they do is they, they say, uh, Mr. Carucci, we take your hands out of your pockets, um, thinking that I'm a threat. And I understand that they have to do that for procedure, but it's the very same officer who uh, child had spent the day with me um, and my children a few weeks earlier and understands that in fact I'm not a threat. This is just a um, parental disagreement and people taking advantage of uh, law enforcement. So that's another thing that we have to keep an eye on where it's, it's fair for both parties and it doesn't um, inflict uh, more pain and, and more conflict into the process. All right, then the uh, next question I think is uh, is already been answered, but we'll ask it anyhow. Uh, the first question is, do you support a change to Massachusetts law for rebuttable presumption of shared parenting, and how strongly or uh, do you support or reject that? And uh, since we've started uh, with Richard, we'll start with you, Paul, this time. Well, thank you for starting me in this one, because this is the easy one, and Rich answered it. And I think absolutely yes. Um, the reality is, and even though both parents don't realize it sometimes because divorce becomes unfortunately a very ugly process. And a lot of times people use it as a way to get even. And so they wanna bite their nose to spite their face almost. So they wanna steal the children and they wanna keep them from the other parents to punish the other parents. But the reality is they're punishing themselves as well. So they're biting their nose to spite their face because it it's difficult to raise children. And, and children need the benefit of, of both um, parents, whether it's uh, uh, you know, the mother or the father. Um, the other thing is it's a lot of stress to raise a child. And if you're gonna steal the, the child, you're gonna have those kids 100% of the time. And that has an impact on your own life as well and your own mental health and the, the health and um, you know, the mental health of the children as well. So yes, um, I think there absolutely needs to be 
um, as you put it, um, re rebuttable presumption. Um, so you need to start with that and only under um, very uh, definable and, and, and um, risky situations should you stray from that. And Richard, uh, your response? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what else can be said? We need we need to have that immediate legal uh, legal presumption of um, shared parenting responsibility. Um, there's, I can look at it. I can't look at it from a parent's point of view, but I can look at it as a child's point of view, having gone through this as on the child's side. Uh, we need to make sure that that children have both parents present in their lives. Uh, there's been other studies as well that show that. A child doesn't develop quite right when both parents are in the when, when both parents aren't in the picture. Uh, not to say that they can't, but they have the best chance of, uh, at their development when both parents are equally in the picture. So there's not much more to add except yes, we need to make sure that this is that this happens and that it's necessary. And from the comments, uh, we have a question uh, that uh, or a statement that uh, many states don't consider shared and equal being the same thing, with shared being. Uh, often less, uh, much less than equal time. Uh, do you want to give us your thoughts on that? Uh, again, Paul, we'll start with you. Um, I think you should start with equal time. Um, and I think that that is a starting point. Um, and hopefully if the parties are able to negotiate um, a little bit from there, it gives everybody an even footing, and I think that better results um, will come from that. And uh, every situation, I'm sure, is slightly different, but you can't stop with um, one party being burdened in the compromise process. So um, I would start with equal time and let the parties display why, uh, why that cannot um, be an acceptable solution. And uh, Richard, your uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I would absolutely start with equal time. That's that's the be that's the most important. But as Paul is right on on this, is that not every situation is the same. You know, I was very lucky to have both parents in town, so you know it was a very seamless transition. I'd go right over to my father's house down the street, uh, so that was that was a very easy transition for me. But not every parent, ha not every family has it that way. Uh, so it needs to start off as an equal, uh, definitely equal time, but uh, depending on uh, on distances and depending on um, the travel burden that it would place and, you know, school and all that kind of stuff, uh, and all those issues it would place on a child, uh, then it could be discussed from there, but it definitely needs to start with equal. All right. Thank you for that response. And the next question, uh, we're going to go uh, a little bit deeper into some of the issues around uh, when parents don't get shared parenting, uh, and that is parental alienation. Uh, now, parental alienation uh, describes a process through which a child becomes estranged from a parent as a result of the psychological manipulation of another parent. Parental alienation often occurs in divorce without penalty. The question is, do you support any reform in this area, and what reforms do you support? And uh, again, Paul, we'll start with you. Well, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, I know the uh, impact of uh, parental alienation uh, far too good. Um, the problem with parental alienation is the courts don't want to recognize it. Um, they think if the child shows up and the child has clean clothes and maybe even has a smile on their face that everything's good. And that's not the case. Um, when you have uh, parental alienation, there's different levels of that sometimes is quite severe parental alienation. And what you're seeing from those children is not the real um, mental health of that child at that time. So yes, you do. Now, Richard had made um, a comment that he was lucky that his father lived down the street and his mother lived down the street. Well, that was wonderful. Um, and I lived down the street and my business was literally down the street. Yet I would never see my children um, and that was a result of the alienation process. And it's pretty darn tough on the adult. And the impact on the children is almost um, un unmeasurable, it's unmeasurable. Um, and those are things that um, 
go with you throughout your life. So the courts need to take a, a, a very, very stern look at this. And they need to, um, as well, notify people within the system. Now, whether that's the uh, social service system, social workers, um, psychologists. Um, and, and the other problem is um, psychologists sometimes want to take the easy way. And they don't want to recognize this alienation either. Because you have to look deep to find it. You have to look very deep. And if a child shows up and they're dressed white, right and they get good grades, they think that everything's good. And you have to look a little deeper and, and people have to be educated um, you know, to look at this. The courts have to recognize it and it, it's got to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. And uh, Richard, your response uh, about parental alienation? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that all it all starts with the presumption of, uh, you know, shared parenting responsibility. I think that's the biggest issue we face here. We need to make sure that parents are getting that uh, initial equal start, because when they don't get that equal start, that's what happens. You know, um, that one of the parents gets alienated. Uh, and that and that's a terrible, terrible thing. We need to make sure that parents, whether they're willing or not, they have to sit down at some point and, and work something out because when, when they don't work together and you know, the law, when, when parents don't work together, the lawyers win. And when the lawyers mm -hmm. win, there's a, there's a drainage of resources. There's a drainage. Uh, there's a, there's a stressful burden and, and everything is just downhill. It's a, it's a downward snowball from there. So the first thing is, you know, we need to make sure that there is a shared parental responsibility a presumption of shared parental responsibility and that, you know, parents are talking. And uh, the, the next question I'm going to ask is a follow-up question uh, about parental alienation. Uh, but the question is fairly simple. Uh, and that is, would you support criminalizing parental alienation uh, once proven in court? And Paul, we'll start with you. Well, I never really thought about the prospect of criminalizing it. I can tell you that the impact of uh, parental alienation is severe enough um, to make it a criminal act. Um, criminal prosecution and imprisonment perhaps might be a difficult um, resolution for the entire family, although it would be easy for one to say, let's do that. I, I think that there might be other measures one can take prior to that. Um, but I don't want to lessen the severity of um, the action uh, when I say that. And uh, Richard, uh, what's your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I, I think that it could be more solved with, you know, civil violations. I think um, it depends because, you know, th there could be a very severe psychological effect on the child when, when uh, a child is put through this. So uh, I wouldn't recommend criminal. Uh, I would say, you know, I think it would be better off to be solved in sort of civil, um, civil matters in terms of like fines and penalties instead of, um, instead of criminal matters. Because like I said, both parents need to be active in the child's life. All right. Thank you for that. And next question is, uh, nationally, around half of first-time domestic violence occurrences happen uh, when the parties are going through a divorce. Uh, some of these may be preventable if there was less conflict in the divorce process. Uh, what measures do you believe are necessary to reduce conflict in divorce? And uh, Paul, we'll start with you. Well, I, I think um, quicker action by the courts will uh, stem some of it. Um, when you f feel that if you have a, a grievance that you could file it, it could get heard and it can be responded to really quickly. Um, I think that that will um, prevent some of it. I also think that um, training and education with anybody involved in the court system, legal system, or social services um, would be very beneficial as well. All right. Thank you. And uh, Richard, your response? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the question one more time? So the question is, uh, nationally, around half of first-time domestic violence occurrences happen uh, when the parties are going through a divorce. Uh, some of these may be preventable if there are less conflict in the divorce process. What measures do you believe are necessary to reduce conflict in divorce? You know, when parents don't get to see their children, that creates a lot of stress. When they're going through a, the extreme financial burden of, of court, that creates a lot of stress. So eliminating those two big things the financial aspect of, of, of family court 
and and the um, uh, restriction of uh, people seeing their children, um, I think that takes down a lot of stress and you know m- maybe allows people to uh, sort of cut down on these on this on this violence because I think that those are the two biggest issues we face when it comes to when it comes to family court. Thank you for that. And uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll give you another follow-up question um, around false allegations in the family court. Uh, how do you think they should be handled and are they handled properly today? Uh, and Richard, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, uh, these are definitely not handled properly today. I mean, with the, we don't have a presumption of, of shared parental responsibility. So a lot of times it's awarded to one parent uh, and that does create a lot of uh, parental alienation and I'm sure Mr. Cruccio can attest to. Um, so it's it's definitely not done right. We need to make sure that um, that money is is not playing a factor anymore. That that the influence of lawyers are not playing a factor anymore. And we need to make sure that that this passes not only in the House like it has twice, but passes in the Senate and is pushed into law. There's no reason why the greatest state in perhaps the United States does not have this common sense family law reform. Thank you for that. And uh, again, Paul, uh, how would uh, the question is around uh, false allegations and if they're handled properly and uh, how you would recommend handling them differently if they are not? Um, I, I think on this one, I'm just going to have to uh, say I, I do, uh, again, uh, I agree, agree with uh, Richard's answer on this one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I could, could add much to it. All right. Thank you. Uh, and the next question is, uh, what's, uh, what sets you apart from your opponents when it comes to social issues for parents and children? And uh, Paul, we'll start with you. Well, I think that the, the good news uh, tonight is that um, we have a consensus of agreements um, that uh, my fellow candidate here and I agree with the need for reform in this area. I think that's good news. Uh, The other thing I think that is good news is you have um, two people agreeing on a solution that is the best for all parties involved, mother, father, children, community, judges in in the nation. Um, So everybody has a, 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 um, everybody wins in this process. Um, So that's the good news. The other thing is you're seeing that from the standpoint of the parent, in my case, um, and I saw the um, devastating effects from as a, as a parent. And I think you're hearing the same response from what was a child uh, and now a young man, a gentleman, Um, the negative impact that he had suffered. So really we have come to a, a, a true consensus of the importance of changing um, this law and how vital it is to everybody. The child, we see the child here, we see a first hand account, we see the parent here, first hand account, account. And we see it in, in our communities. So um, there's a pressing need for this. And the reality is to achieve the mission of uh, the National Parents Organization um, is a no-brainer. It's a win-win for everybody. So yes, we need it in the state. And it's kind of ironic, as Richard says, that we don't have it in Massachusetts, which tends to be, you know, a, a liberal virtue signaling the socially advanced progressive society, yet we're lagging behind here. And that's wrong. So um, I don't know how the other candidates um, in this race would would answer this question. I suspect there'd be some consensus here. But what you can see here is that um, hopefully times are changing. Um, if I happen to be the uh, victor here, it certainly will be a, uh, it's, it's just a win. I mean, you can't lose with it. Um, and obviously, Richard, um, if he is the victor in this contest, uh, he's certainly going to promote those values, ideals and legislation. Um, and hopefully we can all benefit um, down the road. Thank you for that. And uh, Richard, again, I'll repeat the question. Uh, what sets you apart from your opponent when it comes to the social issues for parents and children? Just take a look at who's here tonight. There are six candidates, six candidates total. 
two of them showed up. So, so when it comes down to the issue of, of parents and, and, you know, parent, parental responsibilities and family court reform, you know, two, two candidates showed up here tonight and they discussed this issue. That's how I tell you that it's near and dear to my heart. You know, I've been through this process as a child. Mr. Crucio has been through this process as the parent, you know, we know this issue inside and out. We know how problematic it is. We know how expensive it is. We know there's so many problems with this, with this, uh, with, the, with this process. So that's why we need, why my first priority, one of my first priorities, and, and it's really up near the top, if not the top issue, we need to make sure that we are reforming family court and we get people on board and we push past, you know, the, the bar association. We push past the people who are trying to prevent this from being passed and prevent uh, families from from prospering and thriving after separation and divorce well thank you for that and uh the next question is uh we're going to take a little bit of a departure because certainly uh issues about children's and families and uh and and these sort of things are important uh, but we like to get to know you a little bit better so the question is what social causes besides shared parenting are you passionate about and what advocacy work have you done or plan on doing and uh richard we'll start with you so one of the biggest issues in my campaign that I've held near and dear so far is, is internet access. So one of the biggest things here is that there are, in Suffolk County alone, which is the county that I live in, there are 20,000 people who don't, over 20,000 people who don't have access to broadband internet. Broadband internet, uh, for anyone wondering, is you know, the minimum connection speed, you know, that you need. Um, so broadband is, you know, the way of the future. We need to have broadband internet. And the fact that there's 20,000 people in Suffolk County alone that don't have access to it and over 8,000 who don't have internet, to, uh, don't have any internet access. Uh, one of the things that I'm pushing for is, is legislation that would increase accessibility and affordability to, uh, to internet plans uh, as well, as well. So there's over as well, there's, 43% of people, uh, only 43% of people in this state have access to low cost broadband plans. So we need to make sure that we increase it so that there's 100%. Uh, and with especially, you know, we only have one real internet provider and that's Comcast, unless you want a big ugly dish on your house and, and the internet doesn't work <laughs> on, uh, on rainy days, on cloudy days, stormy days and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> We need to make sure we're increasing accessibility so people can use the internet in their daily lives to work, communicate with family, go to school for entertainment, and to listen to great topics and, and discussions like we're having here tonight. Well, thank you for that answer. And, uh, and Paul, what's, uh, what else are you passionate about? Well, probably the one thing I'd like to speak about um, that I am passionate about um, is a uh, charity called Christmas in the City. So Christmas in the City was uh, created by a friend of mine, Jake Kennedy, who had a physical therapy um, uh, business in, in the city of Austin. And it's been going on now for 20 years. And Christmas in the City uh, provides a Christmas party for every child in every family um, in the greater Boston area that is homeless. So these are kids and families in homeless shelters, single parent families. Uh, certainly some of these are probably as a result of divorce uh, being a single parent and no longer having the means. Um, and it provides a Christmas party for them at the Boston Convention Center. And it's filled with, it's like a zoo and a carnival and there's red carpet for the kids and there's lunch and there's performance and um, it's, it's hot warming. So um, unfortunately, Jay Kennedy has passed away a few months ago, a victim of uh, ALS, but the charity does go on. Um, so when given the chance, um, you know, we try to create new uh, fundraising avenues for Christmas in the city. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to, um, volunteer and, and um, observe the event for yourself. Um, it's like being literally in Disney World at the Boston Convention Center and it's done for homeless children. Every homeless kid in, in the greater Boston area um, in single parents and kids in shelters. So I think that's a great, a great charity. I like to devote my time whenever possible and every single year 
And um, I have to give the accolade there to um, uh, Jay Kennedy, his family and his friends and supporters for that. Well, fantastic. Both very worthy causes and uh, things that the communities need and appreciate. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, the last question is uh, more just uh, a freestyle uh, time for you. Uh, closing arguments. Why should voters choose you over your opponents in this race? Uh, and uh, you have two minutes and we'll start with you, Richard. Absolutely. So when, when, when voters of the 19th Suffolk District, that's Winthrop and Revere, when you step into the voter booth, on March 30th. Think about what candidate you want. Somebody who's, whose allegiance is to their party and their special interests and the union money that they received and everything else, or somebody whose only interest is of the great people in our community and our wonderful state of Massachusetts. So when it comes time on March 30th to vote, vote independent. These issues we talked about tonight, they're not bipartisan issues. They're nonpartisan issues. There should not be politics being played here. And when I'm up on Beacon Hill, I promise I will not be a politician. I will be a hardworking community member who will work for you every day for you to get the work done, not based on party, not based on special interest, but based on what's going to benefit our community. For more information and to volunteer or to donate, visit fusilloforrep.com. And, I, and I, I can't wait, and I humbly ask for your vote on March 30th. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Paul, uh, closing arguments? Well, thank you, Chris. First of all, I would like to thank you, Chris, in the National Parents Organization, because this is truly a worthy cause, and your mission has no downside. And I also like to thank Richard, because, in fact, it was Richard's initiative um, to uh, that mentioned to me that I had missed that this was uh, a forum going on. He mentioned to me of the forum and he, of course, insisted that I participate as well. And I'm grateful for that. So I wanna thank you for presenting this forum and for the tireless work on this vital issue. Although every candidate seeks appeal, approval and votes, I didn't come here tonight to win support or votes in this issue. I'm here because I personally understand the pain and the devastation caused by judicial and legislative shortcomings in this area. I also understand that time lost from separation from losing one's children can never be recovered. And that means we can never forget the importance of this vital issue. So I have benefited from the experience tonight and I actually have learned and I will not ignore this issue. And I wanna thank you for providing this forum. And I wanna thank Richard particularly for offering some insight that I can't get from my own children because um, sometimes the relationship in expressing you know, past, um, past uh, hard, hard feelings are difficult, but I have great relationship with my kids today. My kids are adults, my kids are family people and they have children of their own. So, um, I want to thank you for putting this on, and I want to thank um, uh, the, the mission and wish you success. Well, we certainly thank uh, both of you for coming and attending tonight and sharing your thoughts with us, and uh, the National Parents Organization uh, really appreciates your time and attention to this matter, and uh, I wish you both uh, good luck in the election. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, thank and you. thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for coming. So, <laughs> Anytime, friend. All right, and we are out. Awesome. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, okay. for for coming. That was fantastic. And uh, thank you for thank you for moderating. It was a fantastic conversation. It was a great conversation. Yeah, and I wish you both luck uh, in the election. And and whoever prevails, uh, please go work real hard for these issues because uh, you know it's, it is it's, cer certainly it's a important. no lose for anybody. And um, uh, Richard, I do wish you luck. Thank um, you. Yeah, you're a uh, you're a, a quite a charismatic guy, and I know you're going to be very successful in everything you do. And we'll talk again over the next. Absolutely, month. we will. Absolutely, right. Marie Garcia. All, right. All, right. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Bye, bye. Have a good one. Bye.